Yes, I'm Jamie Allen, I'm the director of consulting for TypeSafe. Um, I've been using lambdas for almost five years now and that kind of freaks me out when I think about it. But uh, I'm lucky enough to have had some experience with this kind of code style that I want to impart some knowledge to you guys about the best way to write your code to get the most out of it. So first of all, I'm the author of Effective ACA and they've asked me to put a slide in here to let you know that it's 40% off outside. There. Anyway, what we want when we're writing our code is to be successful. Ultimately, we want to be able to have code that is going to be maintainable, testable, debuggable, all that kind of fun stuff. And I'm here to tell you that lambdas are not any of that. That's a little controversial. People at Oracle were very nervous whenever they heard I was going to give this talk. And Brian Getz comes up to you and says, can I see your slides? You know that you've touched a nerve. So I love functional programming. We're at a real renaissance right now as far as programming languages go. The JVM has opened up to all sorts of new languages where people are coding with, you know, JRuby and Clojure. And, you know, Groovy and JRuby really kind of started this. And now we're at the point where people are really putting forth some incredible ideas about how we're going to write code and express ourselves. But functional programming has sort of gotten a little bit convoluted lately. And you may have heard people using really weird terms like monads or isomorphic. You know, all that kind of stuff is not the essence of functional programming. Functional programming is really just these three things. First of all, immutability. We want our code to be completely immutable as much as possible. That way we can reason about the effects of what's happening at a given time. If we are going with mutable state, we have to worry about when and who is going to update that value at a particular point in time. It's very difficult to do and it's going to get harder for us now that we're going to be writing on platforms with, you know, thousands of cores and who knows how many threads operating on those boxes. Referential transparency. Uh, there's a really good example that's given by a fellow named Runar Bjarnason who says, anybody here ever use Java's, you know, string buffer? If you put a value inside of Java's string buffer and then you go and say reverse the value, you get a new value that's that string reversed, right? But if you look at the original value, it also was changed. And that's sort of an unintended side effect. You didn't want that original value to change just because you were reversing it to get a new value. So we want referential transparency inside of our code as well. And then we want functions as first class citizens. And by that I only mean that functions are an object just like anything else on the job, you know, on the virtual machine. Uh, you could pass them around, you know, they could be passed into methods and, and be used any which way you want because they're just another object type. And we want declarative code. When we've been writing Java for all these years, we've been sitting here and predefining the, you know, um, the collection we're going to put our results into, and then we've got to express how we're going to iterate through the data that we want to manipulate, and then we've got to do the manipulation and then put it back into that collection. And even though this is a really simple, stupid example, where I'm first, you know, creating a, a numbers list of one, two, three, I'm creating my results list, and then I'm doing a four iteration so that I can, you know, add one to the value and put it into the new list. This is how we've been writing code. And it's not declarative. It's all about expressing how to get something done. And the more we're doing that, the more we're cluttering our code up with details that aren't really relevant to the business problems we're trying to solve. So we wanted to get away from this. And so what are we going to do to do that? Well, we want to use lambdas. And lambdas are an extremely exciting development in the Java 8 community or in the Java 8 platform because you know that Oracle's got a huge marketing push for this, and uh, you know you have to understand what a lambda really is. It's just a function literal. By that I mean you ever put a string inside of quotes inside your code? That's a string literal. A lambda is a function literal. It's not bound to any kind of variable name or anything that you can use or reference. And it's merely one of many possible programming implementation details for functional programming. You can be writing in functional style and never use lambdas. And that's plausible and okay. 
So let's look at how Java 8 has implemented Lambda. At the beginning here, I've got some imports, and I've got the usual class definition, and I also have my public static void main. Nothing crazy there. And then I define my list again. I'm gonna use the same example over and over again where I'm taking a list of one, two, three, and adding one to each value. This is a transformation. Functions represent transformations from one value to a new value. And we have what is pretty much very declarative code here, except it's got some details that have to be expressed. To get our numbers plus one, we have to streamify our numbers list, and then we're going to map over it. Map is a very common concept you're going to see as you start writing more functional code. It just means take this function and apply it to every single value in the collection to, you know, to perform this transformation. And then we have to collect this so that we can put it back into a new list that is the resulting value. You know, that's pretty simple stuff. You'll notice number, arrow, number plus one. Arrow always represents the idea of the transformation. I'm going from a value to a value. And different languages express it the, you know, different ways with their constructs, but it's an arrow. That's what we're doing in our function. JavaScript. Has anybody played here, by the way, with Java 8 and, you know, uh, Nasorn? Well, you know, Marcus has. <laughs> Marcus back there, by the way, is one of the developers on uh, the Nasorn project for Java 8. And I personally think that this is actually a bigger development for Java and the JVM, that JavaScript is now going to have a significantly better runtime, and it's going to allow developers to write scalable JavaScript much more effectively. You know, Node.js, that's a single process. It's not, you know, multi-threaded itself. It's an event loop on a single thread. So Nashorn is going to give people the capability to start writing multi-threaded JavaScript. Now, whether or not you think it's a good idea, that's another matter. Same basic concepts here. I have to define my result, and I have to, you know, define the array list where I'm going to do putting some values into it. And then I'm going to do this parallel stream on the list of values that I want to perform the transformation on. And I'm going to map over it, and I've got this lambda here for function E, where I'm gonna do E plus one, and E is just anything, you know, it's just a, a placeholder representing the value I'm currently trying to manipulate. And then I'm gonna do a for each to put those values back into our my result collection. You know, it's a little more wordy than uh, I would personally prefer, but that's JavaScript for you, right? Scala, of course, you know, I work for the company that makes Scala, so I'm partial to Scala, but don't blame me for that. Um, when we create a, a collection, we can just say that we have a list of the values one, two, three. And then I can say, well, my resulting collection, numbers plus one, is equal to mapping over my numbers and just saying, for each number, add one to it. Very straightforward. Closure, how many people here are closure developers? All right. Well, then I'm gonna say something that might upset you. <laughs> this code, to me, is difficult to read because closure is a lisp on the JVM of sorts, and that means not because you have parentheses everywhere. The parentheses have never bothered me. Infix notation is what I prefer to prefix notation. So if you look here, I'm doing the exact same thing I was doing in the other examples, but it's more difficult to read if you're used to the Java and C style. So here we're mapping over our, our uh, array or our list of one, two, three values, and I'm saying that I'm going to do a plus on some value represented by percent and one. So a little harder to read, but you know what? People who love closure think that this is elegant. So take that as you will. JRuby, anybody here a JRuby developer? Okay, cool. You know, it's great that you can take Ruby code and just put the word requ required Java at the top, and now you've got fully functional Ruby on the JVM. That's great, that's really cool. And the way that they write their code to, you know, create the list and perform the transformation is very simple to understand. So, that's nice. But what's the problem here? If we're going to write code like this, are there any side effects about writing code like this that we need to know about? And I say, yes, 
There are absolutely caveats you need to know before you start doing this. First of all, this is not reusable code. Lambdas only exist in the context of where they are defined. So what are you going to do if you want to reuse that code? You've got to pull that out because you can't reference it in any way, shape, or form. That starts to break our concept of dry. Uncle Bob Martin's always talking about how we don't want to repeat ourselves. Don't repeat yourself, dry. And so you end up writing lambdas and then pulling stuff out anyway. They're not testable in isolation. For you to test a lambda, you have to call the method in which it exists and perform all the tests specific to that lambda while doing all of the other things involved in that method. This stinks. It does. If I just want to test that my lambda's work is, you know, going to do what I expect or fail the way I expect, I have to call all the way through the method. And you know what? I've found that this actually leads to people forgetting to test lambdas because they have so many other things they might be testing inside of their methods that they don't remember all the test cases just specific to how that lambda is going to operate. Maintainability. One thing you may have noticed when we were looking at the code for every single language is that we had to read it to figure out what it was doing. This isn't really a good thing, to be honest with you. Not, and if you have to go and look at somebody else's code later on, you're going to see somebody's written something that is very difficult for you to figure out what they're doing. And they put it inside of a lambda, so it's unnamed. You can't reference it and figure out, you know, was this supposed to be doing something? No. You just have to read through it and figure that out. So to me, that's kind of a waste of valuable developer time. If I've got to go look at code I've written a while ago, I may have forgotten what I did ages ago. And you may find people who will write lambdas like this. This is actually a legitimate example of somebody writing something in Scala, and you know it's a lambda inside of a lambda inside of a lambda with this lambda and this lambda and this lambda all together and this one. You end up trying to figure out what all of this code is trying to accomplish. And that's difficult. This sort of thing will make it harder for you to maintain your code over time. And this is the sort of faces you get whenever you have you know, people coming up to you and seeing your code. They're like, what was that? Lousy stack traces. This is actually one of the biggest problems you'll have. When you're writing lambdas, the JVM or the compiler has to figure out a way to represent the lambda so that the runtime can then you know, parse the bytecode appropriately. The JVM has very strict rules about what it can parse. And, you know, we've been dealing with this in the Scala world and just about every language that is an alternative language on the JVM. We've been sort of square pegs in round holes because we've got to conform to the rules of JVM bytecode, but we want to give you language features that it was never intended to necessarily support. So, Whenever we're creating our lambda representation, we have to do something we call name mangling. The name is really appropriate. They've got to give a representation, a name that can bind to what that lambda is. And then you look at the stack traces that you get out of this, and they're not so pretty. Let's look at some of them. Java 8. I switch out my lambda from doing a plus one, and I just do a simple little divide by zero. Should blow everything up, right? Okay, I get my arithmetic exception, divided by zero. And then when I see inside of my code where it's happening, it's calling this lambda dollar sign zero. And if you write a class and you've got, I don't know, 15 lambdas inside of there, it's gonna be lambda dollar sign one, lambda dollar sign two, add it, you know, all the way up to lambda dollar sign 14. Now the good thing is, you do have your line number. That is going to be your biggest friend. However, some people will write lambda code where they're trying to be concise and they try to do multiple operations on a single line, and then what do you do? You're kind of screwed. Now, you, all you have is a line number because that's the most fidelity you get out of the JVM. You don't know where in that line you blew up. A null pointer exception could have happened in multiple places. Good luck. Now, so in uh, JavaScript, whenever I divide by zero, this is actually standard JavaScript behavior. Instead of getting an error, I get infinity, infinity. JavaScript. 
<laughs> this is actually why I don't want to write JavaScript in a server environment. I may want to write it on the JVM and leverage multi-threaded you know, uh, capabilities, but writing it on a server side to me is dirty because I can't test every possible combination of things that can go wrong with JavaScript because that's just the way that language is. And you know what? I don't want to be wearing the beeper in the middle of the night and getting phone calls because I forgot one test. Uh, so anyway, my favorite tweet ever, Marcus, apologies. <laughs> this one came out in about 2010. JavaScript doesn't have a dark side, but it does have a dimly lit room full of angry clowns with rubber mallets. And that's a pretty apt description of the things that you're going to run into coding JavaScript. So Scala. Now, mind you, I know that this is an incredibly large stack trace, and I want you to see this, because this is representative of Scala trying to execute on a JVM where it's got to do a whole lot of finagling to make things work. And we do the same thing that Java did. We have our you know, anonymous function representation, a non-funk dollar side and one. Again, you know, we've got the line number. I've seen cases where I didn't have a line number in varying languages, and then I was like, I, I gotta figure out which one of these is a non-fun or, or lambda, dollar sign zero. That's hard to do. So you hope you get the line number, and most of the time you will, but there will be occasionally times you won't. So you can find edge cases if you try. Closure, same thing. Again, I, I don't really understand this function representation of fn underscore underscore 10 because it was code that only had one lambda inside of it, but that's, you know. And, and it goes on and on. These stack traces, you know, again, as a case of, you know, trying to do something on a platform that was not really built for this. And also, interestingly, Clojure is, you know, a lazily evaluated language. And by that I mean most of the code we write is strictly evaluated. It's going to be evaluated at the time that it's called. However, with, uh, not when it's called, whenever you're uh, executing your program, it's gonna evaluate it at that time. With a lazy evaluation, you're saying, I'm not going to actually evaluate this until I need to do something with it. And so, for example, whenever I was writing my code here, I have to say println map. If I don't put that println there, believe it or not, this code does not get executed. It does not get evaluated. That's, you know, why you see in the stack trace here so much extra stuff going on here. For example, the error is not occurring inside the lambda, it's occurring inside of the language library where the execution is taking place because it's lazy. So it's, again, a little trickier. JRuby, they actually did this pretty well. I heard a story that, uh, you know, they had problems with really uh, obfuscated stack traces and Charles Nutter, who does an amazing job, he, uh, you know, sat down with uh, other JRuby developers and they found ways to express exceptions pretty nicely. So this is, you know, good for them. Now, debugging. We have only line number fidelity, like I was saying. And whenever we're used to using IDE tools for putting breakpoints on code, you're typically going to find yourself writing lambdas that, you know, just say numbers.map, here's my function, right? But that's all on one line. Now you put a breakpoint on there and you want to iterate through the transformations taking place on the collection that you're walking through and you may not be able to. This is a tooling problem. And at TypeSafe with our Scala IDE and also the IntelliJ Scala IDE, you can put a breakpoint and they figured out how to fix this. But know that when you're using a debugger, it's a bit of a wild card. You don't know for sure that you're going to have an IDE that is going to support lambda iteration and transformation. So a real quick digression here. Um, in programming language theory, we have the idea of lambdas, our function literals, and then we have the idea of closures. And this is what Groovy has always called their lambdas. They've always said that they're closures. The idea being that I can close over some state from outside the context of my lambda. And that's what I'm doing here inside of my little code snippet. I've got a variable defined outside of the context of my lambda. But then I'm referencing it inside of my lambda to do the addition, right? 
I'm closing over state. This is one of the most dangerous things you can do, especially if you start doing asynchronous development. If you're using any kind of futures that use closures like we do in Scala, it's very easy to close over some state and you know, God help you if it's mutable because then you're in real trouble. Now we can say, because we have rules in the Java world, that we're going to only close over final variables. And that's great, except we all know that you can make a collection final. That means you can't reassign to a new collection, but the contents of the collection can certainly change. You're closing over mutable state when you do that, and that's going to cause you things like race conditions. I guarantee it, if you're doing any kind of asynchronous development, it's going to be hard. So FYI, closing over state isn't necessarily what you want to do. Think about things when you close over and think deeply about what you're going to do to that value and if it can change on you. So yeah, always you know, focus on the values that you're closing over. Oops. So what is our solution? How are we going to get around this? What are we going to do to write code that gives us all the benefits of functional programming and benefits of leveraging these what we call higher order functions like map and filter. What about named functions? That's a plausible idea and from here on out I'm actually going to be using Scala as an example just because the code is going to look a lot simpler than it does with Java. So how are we going to use named functions in order to get the most out of our functional programming? Here's the example again. Add one to value is now a defined function. And I'm saying, you know, it's, it's going to take some integer, like an argument, and I'm going to apply the transformation of add one to the integer. And now inside of my code, I'm saying, well, I've got some collection of numbers. I'm going to map over it. And then instead of saying, you know, put the lambda right in here and the people have to read through what's going on, now they can just say add one to value. And it's more expressive this way. It's more clear what's going on. It's more testable, more debuggable. These are all good things. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that this was the right answer. And this is going to vary for every language that you start playing with if you're using Closure or JRuby or Groovy and stuff like that. You have to pay attention to what's happening here inside of your stack traces. Even though I defined this named function, I still got this exception that reference a non-fun dollar sign one. And you say to yourself, well, why? Because again, the way we were trying to express our, our lambda, our function, um, doesn't translate for Scala's compiler directly to something named inside of what it produces in the classes. So, ugh, what do we do? There's a concept of lifting a method. And this means that I can just have a library of ordinary methods, and at the time I want to use them, they get lifted into functions. Now mind you, this is actually a compile time thing, not a runtime cost. But it does mean that you can write ordinary looking methods that don't look a little nutty like this bad function I wrote right here. Just ordinary methods that take arguments and have return values. And at the time that they're going to be used to transform values inside of a collection or however you're using your lambda, it's going to lift it. And this is a really powerful concept. Now when we do this, and I say that, and again in Scala I've got some function I'm calling bad function, and I'm still representing it as a function here. I'm not quite doing the method lifting. I mean it is because I've defined it using Scala syntax to be a method, but it's still got function style coding, right? Function style syntax. Now whenever this, you know, fails, because it will with the arithmetic exception, I do see the name of the function that I want. Bad function is showing up inside of my stack trace, and that's awesome. But there's something hidden here. That dollar sign one, that's implying to me that every time I call my function, it's creating a new one. And if you look at my val, uh, my, my def bad function, I've got an equal sign there. It's equal to this function. Every time it's called, it's reevaluating to a new instance of 
that function. Maybe not what I want, because there's nothing about this function that is relevant to, need to you know, needing to be re-evaluated on every call. So when you see something like that dollar sign zero for lambda dollar sign zero or, or method dollar sign zero, when you see those dollar sign blah, 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 the name mangling, know something's happening there with instances. And you probably don't want that. So how do we get around this? Well, def in Scala is not a stable um, way of, it, it's a method call syntax for you know, how, how you're going to evaluate, right? If you do a val in Scala, or if you define a final variable in, in, in uh, Java, those are evaluated immediately, whereas defs are evaluated at the call site. What we want to do is stick with the basic method syntax of our def bad function, taking an argument x of some type integer, and uh, you know, divide by zero. Of course, that's not what we really want to do inside of a lambda, but this is our simple pedantic example. And by following the simple method syntax, now we get exactly what we want. We are no longer creating a new instance of a function every time that we are calling, and the code is very readable to any developer. They don't have to know Scala deeply to understand how that method exists. Um, and we get the stack trace that we like. It's very clean now. It says exactly where the problem occurred. This is going to help you in so many different ways. So the benefits. You can't close over variables. You get better stack traces. You uh, get more debuggable code, right? You have more testability. I don't care if you do your testing TDD style or if you do it while you're coding or if you do it after the fact but I really care if you test. You must write tests, because otherwise there's no way to be sure that when you change things that you haven't broken everything. And so this is a really big deal to me. It's more maintainable and descriptive to write code this way. And it's also reusable, because it's just methods. There are a library of methods that you're creating as functions that you can use anywhere you want. And then you can start making combinations out of them. So the rule of thumb, reserve lambdas for very specific and easy to read usages. For example, when you're adding one to a value, that's a really great time to use a lambda, because anybody could probably read that code and figure out what you're doing. That's great, but if you're going to do anything more complex than that, think about pulling it out into a method and allow the lifting of the method to work in your favor. You'll get a lot more out of it. Now, this is sort of on us as language creators. That goes for us in Scala, uh, you know, the JRuby people, Clojure, Reticky. All of us have a responsibility to you to do this better. And that includes with tooling. So that when you get into a situation where you're finding things are all kinds of hairy when you're trying to do your work with lambdas or functional programming, you don't end up in a position where you can't figure it out because it's too obfuscated. That's what's happening right now. The JVM is going to change in this regard, in my opinion. The JVM is going to start to become more supportive of functional programming. And that's not just you know, the byte code itself. That's also going to be things like garbage collection. It's going to have to start reflecting the realities of the way we're writing code for this multi or many core environment, which is going to create a lot of garbage as we try to stay immutable. but. We're going to not keep it around very long, and it should never get promoted up through into old gen. This will be a really big deal, but for right now, I don't think that the profile exists for you know, the actual um, GC. You have to tune it yourself, and it's not easy. Never is, regardless of what language you're writing in. Is anybody here a GC you know, uh, tuning ninja? I'm not. I'm not bad at it. I've read Java Performance by Charlie Hunt. It's a great book, but you know, it's not an easy thing to do. So at TypeSafe, we're working really hard on our Scala ID, and we're sharing as well. You know, this isn't just a case of one company trying to advance our particular, you know, our, our particular view. We help other languages. I've seen Martin Odersky working with the people trying to create the language Kotlin, because it matters that people have 
great ideas about languages and being able to leverage them. It's really important for the development of our you know, language um, ecosystem, if you will. The more we innovate, the better we're gonna all be as coders. And the more we're gonna be able to leverage code that is gonna be effective to what we're trying to do, as opposed to doing all the plumbing work that we've had to do up until now. So that's it, thank you.